Um, so, you know, right up front, superannuation is the, the number one go-to when people start thinking about year end. Um, and it's usually because superannuation gets left, left to the last minute with most business clients. So um, we wanted to run through what you are entitled to. Okay, so, and importantly, some of this terminology is, gets a bit technical, but concessional superannu superannuation contributions are taxed at 15%. And as it says there, you are entitled to have $25,000 worth of concessional contributions every year. We're not gonna go into too much detail on non-concessional. Non-concessional is when you don't claim a tax deduction. Um, the upside to that is there's no tax on it within the super fund itself. Um, personal contributions are especially useful for people who are on higher marginal tax rates, okay? So if you've got a high tax rate, um, you do get the benefit of um, a greater tax deduction or a greater rate of tax on those deductions. Because for example, you might be contributing superannuation um, and you will get a deduction at 45% and the amount of tax paid on superannuation within your super fund is only 15%. So that's a difference of 30% in relation to those contributions. And that is significant these days. We um, we don't get left with a lot of opportunities, but um, a, a reduction in tax rate of 30% on $25,000 is quite significant. So, um, and whatever the level of superannuation, if you're on those, t those higher tax brackets, um, it is beneficial. So at the end of the day, I said, we're not giving financial advice as to you know, where it's going in superannuation, whether it's an industry fund, a retail fund, a self-managed super fund. Um, we're just talking about the, the tax benefit of getting that money in. So uh, importantly, at this time of year as well, everyone talks about 30th of June, you must get it in by the 30th of June. Um, and Claude will confirm this as well. Over the past three or four years, we've actually seen superannuation funds in, um, instituting cutoff periods prior to 30th of June and it's got to do with processing. So in the old days, you used to be able to drop in your contribution on the 29th of June. That's no longer the case. Um, it can be with a self-managed super fund, but with most other superannuation funds, they will tell you, if you want a contribution this financial year, you must have it in, for example, by the 25th of June or by the 20th of June. So please keep that in mind. Important thing is don't leave this to the last minute if you done your sums, if you want to get money into superannuation and you're convinced that that's the way to go, do it today, do it Monday. Um, you know, get moving on this before it's too late because the reality is if it's not in the fund and not um, categorised as a contribution this year, you will miss out, it'll go into next year's and that could upset things next year as well, okay? Um, uh, as we say there, people, we put a bit more detail in this today, guys, because um, we're, we're hearing that people are uh, utilising the slides to go back and refresh their memory. So we put in there, people who benefit the most are those earning above 37,000 a year. That's where the marginal tax rate gets above that 30%. Okay, so um, you know, you've, you've got a valid, a very valid claim there. Prior to that, it's in the, you know, around the 20% mark. So it's a big saving. Um, so keep that in mind in relation to super. Um, catch up super payments, Claude, I might get you to talk a little bit on catch up payments. Yeah, thanks, Calvin. Um, hopefully everyone can see me okay. I had to close the blinds behind me as there was a bit of glare. Um, but yeah, so look, very briefly, this one relates to the government announced an initiative a couple of years back, um, whereby um, for this financial year, you were able to make um, what they call a carry forward or catch up on super contributions. And basically, if your fund has a balance of less than 500000 and in the last, say, two financial years, you didn't contribute the maximum $25,000 per year, then you can um, increase that for this year uh, as a catch-up. So as, an, as a very quick example, let's say you contributed 15000 in 18 year, 15000 in the 19 year, you've effectively had $10,000 per year to reach the maximum cap of 25. 
So therefore, in the 20 year, not only could you have put the 25 as a full concessional contribution, but you could also put an additional 20 being the 10 and 10 from the two previous years. Um, so you could have effectively contributed 45,000, if my sums are right, um, as a concessional contribution for the 2020 year. And that's to continue as well, Claude, isn't it? Going yes, forward? I believe so. Yeah, that I haven't, okay. haven't announced anything that it's going to um, stop, but um, yeah, the 2020 year is a first year that this can be accessed and used. Okay. And this is particularly useful. I mean, I, I think the original intent was for perhaps people going out of the workforce for um, you know, a period of time or having reduced earnings, but giving them the, the ability to get that up to that threshold on an average basis. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yep. And, and talk, I think one of the examples I use, it's not to be sexist, but they refer to women who stop work to have a baby or anything like that. So it gives them the ability to, to get that top up happening. Okay, um, so thanks for that, Claude. The, the second point is in relation to, and we're using an acronym there, but it's high, high net worth um, people where if you do earn over $250,000 a year, and that is inclusive of the amount of money going into super on your behalf. Um, so it could be that you're on a wage of 240, but you've got super on top of it. You fall into this category. They effectively will apply 30% tax rate on contribution. So that's where, um, as again, again, we come back to this 30% marginal rate of tax. Um, you're, you, where you're above that, even so, you're still better off putting money into super from a tax perspective. Okay, but it is worth keeping in mind because people often overlook it thinking, all right, well, I'm only getting taxed at 15% in my, my super fund. Unfortunately, what happens is once the super fund lodges their, lodges their returns, once you lodge your personal tax return, we then get a lovely notice from the um, ATO, which is a, I think it's a 293 notice that says, all right, well, we're gonna tax you at, the, at an extra 15% on these earnings. So um, having said that, there is still benefits in, um, in getting money into super. So chat to us, do your sums. We're happy to, to work through these sorts of things with you. Um, uh, that was all I had on superannuation. Claude, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on super? No, just the, in that last comment, Calvin, is um, nothing needs to be done from you personally. Um, it's just that when your um, tax return gets lodged, the ATO will automatically um, notify you if you have made, if your income is over 250 and you have made a contribution to super, concessional contribution, they will let you know and they will give you the uh, notice of assessment for that additional contribution. And you've got an option of whether you pay it yourself or you can um, request the funds be released from your super fund, in which case there's forms to complete and send, up, and send away to your super fund. So, um, yeah, nothing happens until it gets triggered by the ATO notice. Um, again, it's another point that we plan for when we're you know, talking, talking to clients about what their likely income levels are, what they're going to do with super, how we structure things going forward. So thanks for that, Claude. Um, bad debt write-offs. This is one that, that quite often gets overlooked. Um, and, you know, we often get faced with it when we do the, the accounts for a client after the end of the financial year. And you'll sort of talk to a client about, all right, well, accounts receivable. What about all these debts? Are you going to collect them? And nine times out of 10, someone or the clients will say to us, I'm never going to get those debts. So correctly to claim a deduction or to reduce your income, in relation to a bad debt that you are never going to collect, it must be written off before 30th of June. Okay. So, um, and the, in these days of electronic, um, you know, cloud accounting and electronic processing and all the rest, um, you do need to take certain steps. So very important that you, prior to the 30th of June, review your bad debts. Um, if there are any bad debts that, you know, you're not going to collect, you've struggled, you know they're never coming in, um, uh, make a point of writing them off prior to 30th of June. So if you need help with that, let us know, but it is as simple as saying, all right, I'm gonna write that debt off, it's, it's no longer collectible. That's not to say that in some way you, you can't collect that debt at a, at a point in time in the future. So if it comes back, that's fantastic. And then it just comes into income. However, if you've taken the steps, written to the, to the client or customer, 
uh, sent out debt collectors, spoken to lawyers, done X, Y, and Z, then you have, and as long as it's documented um, in some way, so you may have emails, you may have letters, you may have responses from the client, write the thing off. It reduces your income in this current financial year. Um, a lot of these measures that we're taking this financial year are even more important because as we've got down the bottom there, the corporate tax rate, so if you operate through a company, is actually reducing by 1.5% on the 1st of July with the intention that the rate will go to 25% in the near future. So even if some of these measures are instituted to sort of um, reduce income this year, but the income's going to flow through in the 2021 year, you will save 1.5% tax on that. It doesn't seem much, but it, it all adds up. So we're, we're fairly focused on making sure we, we optimise everything in this current financial year for that very reason. Um, so bad debts is an easy one. If you've got bad debts and if they've been hanging around and you can't collect, write them off, deal with them. So um, I hope that, uh, you know, they get paid eventually, but, um, you know, have a pretty harsh view, harsh look at your debtors ledger this year. Um, timing of in invoices and expenses, similarly to what we talked about with, you know, reducing income this year might come through next year. Businesses should aim to minimise income and maximise expenses prior to year end. Now we can't get too cute. The ATO don't like it when we get too clever with these sorts of things. Um, however, if there are opportunities to um, incur expenditure prior to 30th of June, if there is work that, you know, normally you think, and a lot of people do this, they say, oh, I'm going to invoice prior to the end of the financial year because there will be, um, uh, people need to spend their budgets. We see that when you're dealing with governments in particular. However, the work's not going to be done until after the end of the financial year. You need to think long and hard about, all right, well, what is appropriate for your business and what's appropriate to, to maximise your position. Okay, so as we say there, ideally you want to bring forward expenses into the current tax year and defer income into the following tax year. It's easier said than done, but it's worth considering. So please just give that some thought as well. Uh, and as we say there, while well, you'll still have to eventually pay tax on what you've earned, in the short term, you'll have saved money and increased your tax year cash flow. So this is all about maximising your position, maximising the long-term benefit. So short term, if you can preserve some cash flow for another 12 months, you can utilise it in your business, you could utilise it personally, if you're capable to with your business structure, um, and that all adds up to help you um, run your business. Um, business structuring, again, at this time of year, we do a lot of work with clients to determine whether they are in the appropriate business structure. Okay, now business structures come in many forms. There's sole traders, partnerships, discretionary trusts, unit trusts, companies. Um, again, business structures extend to uh, testamentary trusts, self-managed super funds, but predominantly, it's those first four or five that we look at. Um, and we look at not only making sure you're in the best business structure for tax purposes, but also for asset protection and risk mitigation purposes. Because despite what we've talked about for the last 20 odd minutes, our life doesn't all revolve around tax and nor should yours. Okay, so a lot of people come to us saying, I want to pay less tax, however, we often see the priorities are in relation to um, asset protection and risk mitigation and risk reduction. Um, so that could mean that you somewhere down the line pay more income tax, but if it protects you and protects your business and your intellectual property and your, um, your legacy, then that's equally as important, if not more important. So just keep that in mind. So we do quite often talk to clients at this time of year to say, all right, well, you've been training as a sole trader for all these, these years. Are you aware of the risks? Are you aware of the income tax you're paying? Are you aware of the options? So keep it in mind, consider your business structure. Right up front, make sure you understand what your business structure is and what it means to you. Um, that it's critical, we, we talk to so many new clients that come in the door who don't understand how they operate and don't understand why they operate in that way. And it, it is mind blowing for people like Claude and I 
to talk to business people who have been in business for years and they're fantastic business people um, and, you know, fantastic people as well, quite, you know, very bright and understand how the world works, but they don't understand their business structure. And that's not their fault. That's the accountant's fault that put them into that structure. So I'm not being critical of any business people, but we, we um, pride ourselves on making sure that our clients actually understand how they operate and what structures they've got and is it right for them okay so i'm not going to go through and give everyone a a debrief on all of the various structures um, but what i will say is you need to understand what structure you're in if you're not sure talk to us if you don't understand why you're there talk to us and if you think there might be a better way or if you want to canvas that discussion or topic with us come and have a chat we'll have a coffee we'll talk about you know what you're doing why you're doing it and you know primarily to make sure that there's not a better way or if there is we'll get you into that better way okay um as it says there's many factors to consider okay right through from um you know legal requirements some people can't trade as companies or trusts they have to be soft traders other people can only trade as companies other people it's it's ideal that they operate in a trust because of their family dynamic they can they can distribute income where they like so um, let's look at what other assets, what other debts you've got, what other liabilities around, around the place that we need to take into account. Um, we also do look at the costs of setting up structures and maintaining them, um, as well as the likely tax benefits, obviously. But that almost happens, at, you know, it's second nature to, to be considering those things. So um, please talk to us about these things. Um, Claude's put up a case study here, which we ran through a few years ago. So Claude, I might let you run through this. Sure thing, Kelp. Um, so yeah, this was a, a situation where we had a long-standing business client who operated through a discretionary trust or family trust, as they're more commonly known. Um, and there was a period of um, sustained profits um, whereby the income was predominantly only able to, to be distributed between husband and wife. Um, couldn't distribute to children either because they were uh, minors under 18 or they had other employment, they had students who had hex debts and the like. So it wasn't really appropriate to um, distribute, you know, a meaningful amount to the children. Um, so we looked at it um, through the case whereby we incorporated a new company to act as a corporate beneficiary of the trust. Um, these are sometimes known as bucket companies. And the planning behind this was we um, distributed incomes to husband and wife up to a level of, I think back then it was $80,000, which is what the bracket was before the 30% um, rate kicked in. With all additional um, incomes going to the new corporate beneficiary. And the aim of this was that as a cross as a family group, is what we like to call it, that nobody paid more than 30 cents in the dollar of tax. So, so that was a good strategy. Um, I don't remember the exact dollar savings for this particular case, but it was, it was a five figure sum of tax savings. So I ended up um, a good result for the client and um, he was more than happy with the outcome. So um, yeah, and that's been in place now for probably three years, I think from memory. And it's, um, and it's going well for them. It's working well. And again, that's not something we can do post 30 June. Yeah. Unfortunately. So post 30 June. And again, if you, we, we utilize um, discretionary trust significantly in our practice and uh, as do a lot of our clients, obviously. Um, so as most of you on the call would know, uh, trust distributes its income with the discretion. So we usually look prior to 30th of June to say, where is this income best place to go? Where can we minimize the level of tax on it? Who is it appropriate to distribute it to? And in the old days, uh, when I first started, it used to be that the tax office allowed you to finalize your financial statements, work out what income you had, and then you could sit back in the, you know, had the luxury of, of hindsight, say, so oh, we made a profit of a million dollars. What do we want to do with it this year? Uh, probably five or maybe, 10 years ago now, I can't correctly remember when it was, but uh, it was a few years, the, the tax office took a view and a very firm view and said, 
we won't allow you that anymore. A trustee legally must decide before 30th of June where that income goes and you must therefore document it. So again, as a number of our clients on the call would know, um, we now do our trust resolutions or trust minutes as they're called as well um, prior to 30th of June. So we'll, we'll talk to you about what income you had, what income other people have and have the discussion about where this should be distributed. And, I, and we've been criticised for you know, this being overkill. However, it's a legal requirement and as a trustee, you must do this pre-June. So it's at, this, at the, that point where if you've got this level of income that Claude talked about with this client, and I, I guarantee you it was significant, um, and you want to put a company in place, you must do that pre-June because you can't put a company in place or distribute to a company that didn't exist at the 30th of June. So really important and critical that you, you give it some thought. Um, and that case study, we, can, we could talk to you for an hour about that because there were a couple of other variations as well. Um, the, um, the other thing that we do look at at year end, as we said earlier, is asset protection. Okay, so as it says, just like your home, your car and your family, your business should also be protected. We're very big on this. I've sort of learnt um, over the years that this is an area that people don't often consider. They sort of lump all of their assets into one bucket um, and they take all the risk in that same bucket. So it doesn't take much to put all those assets at risk. You need to look at everything. You need to look at all of your obligations, whether it be um, just loans to banks, to um, amounts owing to um, suppliers and creditors, whether it's what you owe to your employees, whether it's your landlord. The landlord is often the, the biggest noose we have around our necks these days because it's not just what you have to pay per month, it's the, the term of the lease. So, so you need to give some serious thought to risk, you know, risk management and asset protection. Um, as we said, there risk varies between industries and also upon the obligation. So as I said, employees, leases, guarantees, um, loans, income tax, GST, the ATO will come at you hard, really hard, if you don't pay, if you make no effort to pay, those sorts of things. Um, superannuation's the next one as well. If you've got employees and you owe superannuation and don't pay it, the ATO will have you in your sight, particularly with, um, uh, single touch payroll these days, or STP as it's called. Um, similarly, directors, employers, and business people generally have a large number of obligations. If you're a director of a company, you have a responsibility to shareholders, but also to the general public, to your employees, and to ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. So you need to be aware. It's the old saying of, you know, ignorance is is not bliss, um, you, can't, you can't ignore um, or plead ignorant of uh, all of these responsibilities and it's getting tougher out there. So, you know, please be aware. Um, uh, JobKeeper, we, and sorry, going back to that, year-end strategies, that's probably, um, you know, the majority of things we want to talk about with year-end strategies, but I know we'll get into a few more issues um, a little bit later in the, in the call, so. Um, uh, the uh, sorry, I was just checking. There's a couple of messages up there for me. Um, JobKeeper, we have included just a quick summary on JobKeeper because we are still getting questions on JobKeeper. So I'm going to fly straight over the top of this because we've um, between Claude and I, we've just about done JobKeeper to death. We've got most clients up and running with it. However, we understand there's still a lot of uncertainty and and confusion out there. So. In relation to JobKeeper, eligible employers are those that experience 30% fall, we're aware of that. And you, um, uh, you can pay eligible employers um, are enabled to pay their employees $1,500 at least per fortnight, okay? However, those employees must be getting paid that amount. So we're, we're seeing the, the reality of this at the moment. We're seeing where people are saying they've paid employees but they haven't. We're seeing um, people who are on the flip side of that, and that's a negative. So unfortunately, it's where people are not quite understanding things. So it's critically important that you make these payments. But on the flip side, on the positive side, we're seeing clients 
receiving some significant sums of money from the government, which is fantastic. And that's what it's there for. It's enabling them to continue their business, continue to employ people, not have to stand them down, put them off permanently. So really important thing to make sure you're, you're across. Uh, again, we're running through the process here. This is really the six or seven step process that we um, run everyone through make sure that you do qualify, that you've got eligible employees, that you are an eligible employer, and you've made all the necessary payments. And then once we do that, then you need to make application, lodge the declarations, those sorts of things. So um, if you're unsure in any way about this, please contact us. It's, from our point of view, it's pretty straightforward. However, it's a process and it's a stepped process. And if you miss one step or get it wrong, you won't get paid. So this, in my view, this is money for jam. If you qualify, grab it with both hands and utilize it in your business. Um, instant asset write-offs, this is a big um, uh, year-end strategy and it's changed in the last week, it's changed as well. In fact, in the last, I think, three days, Claude, is that right? Yeah, definitely um, within the last week. Yeah, so, um, so the instant asset write-off, again, we've had a flurry of activity in this regard where a lot of people kept their hands in their pockets over the last fortnight, everyone said, okay, we're coming out of this. We've got some cash flow. We've got JobKeeper coming in. I want to buy some assets. And this is really attractive. In my experience, I've never seen an instant asset write-off or investment allowance, as we used to call it, of this size. Um, so this allows businesses to get an instant write-off for assets up to $150,000. Okay, now that's not an aggregated amount. That doesn't mean that, oh, well, all of your assets, as long as they don't exceed 150, that's $150,000 per asset, okay? So if you went out and bought three pieces of equipment and they all cost $149,000, each one of those will allow you an instant write-off, correct? Claude, that, I'm spot on with that. We're, we're getting yes. some feedback, aren't we? Yeah, definitely. So it, it applies to each a piece of capital equipment that you buy, asset. So you could potentially buy 10 forklifts for $149,000 each, and you will get a 100% deduction for $1.49 million during that year, if that was the case. So it, it really important, There's been, there has been a bit of misunderstanding in that uh, regard. Even more important, and again, we're talking about a year-end strategy, when this was originally announced back in March, it was to end at 30th of June. Um, I can't quite recall, it was either Monday or Tuesday night, the government came out and said they're extending it till 31 December, okay, which is fantastic. Um, I think they realise that people have been a bit slow on the uptake. However, they do want, they do want this ongoing investment to continue. So they've extended it. If you're talking tax planning for the 2019-20 year, do it pre 30 June, have that asset in, installed, ready for use, um, you know, and you'll get that deduction. So keep it in mind when they talk about a, a write-off, it is accelerated depreciation. It's 100% depreciation on that asset. So, um, and it'll come straight off your taxable income for this year. And keeping in mind that the tax rate's reducing by one and a half percent, it can really add up on $150,000. So, um, Without the extension, the instant asset write-off threshold uh, reverts to $1,000, okay? Now, this last line here referred to our original slides prior to that middle one, if that makes sense. So that's what you'll go back to. Once this 150 is finished, you go back to only being capable of writing off assets up to $1,000. Anything over $1,000, you must depreciate over the life of the asset. So, um, just really bear that in mind if you're looking to buy something. Um, what this means from 1 July 19 to the 11th of March, um, eligible assets up to 30,000 can be written off because that was the previous incentive they put in place. Um, however, from the 12th of March to the 31st of December this year, it's now 150. So hopefully that makes sense. As I said, there's been some confusion. So um, if you have questions, please let us know. Um, in relation to your own business, this, we, we dropped this in because we wanted people casting forward as well. We wanted people to start thinking about, well, well what, what needs to be done in relation to year end, but into the next financial year, okay? So this is where we really said, look, 
just get across the basics in relation to your business. Make sure everything's reconciled. Look at your debtors and creditors or accounts receivable and accounts payable and make sure they're all legitimate, collectible, payable. Um, they match the invoices. Um, look at your wages and superannuation payments. Again, this is a simple one, but in relation to wages and super, and it goes back to timing of expenses, this is a really big one as well. Wages and superannuation, but more so super, your superannuation for your employees in particular may relate to the month of June or even the, the June quarter. And so normally with a business, if you've got an, an expense that relates to this financial year, we can accrue that as a deduction in the current financial year. However, superannuation, that doesn't apply to. So unless you pay superannuation by the 30th of June for your employees and it is deposited into the fund and taken care of and processed, you will not get that deduction. So again, this is quite a simple tax planning measure to say, if you've got your superannuation for your staff, make sure it's well and truly paid by the 30th of June. Similar to your own personal contributions or super for yourself, your employee's super, your, your SGC as it's often called, must be paid by 30 June to get a deduction this year. So again, just note that, make sure it gets paid obviously depend upon cash flow um, and wages are similar just make sure you, you pay your wages if you're going to pay bonuses to people this financial year or anything else pay it this year rather than next year all right it just advances some of these things but across the board as well make sure all of your wages are reconciled make sure everything's taken care of so that people can get their tax returns done we can get your financials done quickly as well uh, and that um, takes me to the next slide where just generally in relation to your business, make sure you've got all your ducks in a row. Okay. There's so many clients that we see, they say, I really need to get my financials prepared this year. I need to do my tax return. I need to apply for finance. And yet they haven't taken the time to make sure they tidy up the books. So it, it sounds pedantic, but you know, for us as accountants, we need all these things taken care of to make sure we can do the best possible job for you. Okay. Claude, is there anything else that you wanted to add in that? In that no, area? just no, only as far as um, getting things ready for next year, you know, always make a point that as soon as 30 June clicks over, um, you know, when you get copies of your 30 June bank statements, loan statements and the like, um, you know, just send them through to us because they're things that we will need at year end to do your, your work. Um, so if you can just automatically send it to us, we will keep it on file and, um, and then we don't have to bother you about it in three, four, six months time when sometimes uh, they can't be found. Um, the other thing is we do have a couple of really good checklists um, specifically around the fact of payroll. And if you are using zero to maintain your, your payroll, get in contact with us because we've got some really good checklists that zero have provided that um, go through everything that you need to do prior, prior to 30 June. So yeah, if you're using zero, reach out and we'll uh, happily, um, send you out a checklist for payroll. Spot on. And Claude, thanks for mentioning zero. It brings me to something else that's, that we haven't put into the, the presentation, but um, something else that people do often come to see us about at this time of year is to change their accounting system. Um, and so we, as most of you would know, we recommend and highly value zero as a cloud accounting product um, for various reasons. Happy to have that discussion with you as well. But uh, having said that, if you're not using an accounting system currently, or if you're using one that you're not happy with, please talk to us now, because ideally you want that in place from 1st of July, or as it's close to it as you possibly can, uh, to get the greatest benefit. So um, always happy to talk about zero and, um, and let you know the benefits and why we recommend it, why we use it. We use it right across our business, um, as well as even personally. So. Um, for all the functionality and the and the access. So keep that in mind. Again, it's after the end of the financial year, if you're running, for example, MyOB, and then you use that for three months, then you get onto zero, that even makes our life more difficult because you're running across two accounting systems. So happy to talk to anyone about this that at this time of year, um, even if it is in July, because again, we've got capacity, you know, now and in, into July to be able to have a chat. Um, so talk to us about that. Um, 
Business continuity plan. Again, those who have sat in on our webinars previously um, are well aware of um, you know, the seven key areas that we talk about with business continuity. We introduced this primarily when you know, we all got hit with, uh, with COVID-19 and we were all having to look at our businesses, look at our livelihood, look at our people, those sorts of things. So we'll continue to talk to people about this and we are continuing to talk to them about it. Um, but we left this in our presentation just again to refocus people to look at these key aspects of their business and their life. Um, and it's, you know, when you break it down between those areas, very simple. Um, however, we keep coming back to it. And if nothing else going forward in your business, I encourage all of you to continually look at this, even if we, this forms the basis of a key management agenda within your business. Um, and even strategic agenda to look at all these separate factors in your business. And, and you'll pick up certain things in there, you know, protection and um, employees and those sorts of things, which we've touched on today as well. So um, a lot of this is very common to, um, to what we've been talking about. Uh, happy to talk to you. There's a lot more detail about this on our website. Uh, if you want to have a look and I'll talk to you about a few other things that are there also in a short, short moment. Um, again, talking to you about, you know, how we can help you, but uh, the BCP is pretty important to us. And uh, we've seen some clients that it, it actually helped them get through the last few months. If uh, they, they've commented and said, look, if they hadn't worked through this process with us, they wouldn't be here today. They would have been in all sorts of trouble. So um, again, we, it's not with that same purpose in mind. However, we'll continue to work with clients on that basis and, and help them strategize and, and understand where they're at and what they need to do. Um, that's pretty much it for our, for the presentation and what we had in mind today to present to you. Um, however, um, what I would like to do is jump into the questions that have been asked. Okay. So, and I can see that there's a couple of questions actually put into the chat session as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the questions that we have got currently. Um, and then we'll come back to that in particular, the last question that I saw there. But if I do forget that, please pull me up guys. Um, so as I said, these are in no particular order though. I think they're in the order they were actually raised with us. Um, so, um, just let me run through these and what I will do for the benefit of our recording is read out the question and then we'll look to answer it. Okay. So, um, so the first question we had was when will the next cash boost credit slash payment be available? Um, and my understanding from that question, and correct me if I'm wrong, is in relation to the boosting cash flow stimulus amounts. Um, and so, Claude, I'm going to hand to you actually to, to let people know what that's about. But I will say, however, it depends on what you have currently claimed or previously claimed and you know what you're entitled to. So, Claude, do you want to have a, have a go at that? Yeah, sure, Calvin. Thanks. Um, so, basically, you are um, entitled as a business um, to have credited up to $50,000, sorry, a maximum of 50,000 for um, the year ending 30 June 2020, um, with another $50,000 kicking in uh, from 1 July. So if um, between, so, and this all started off on the lodgement of your March, Baz, from memory. Um, if you would have, if you've already claimed the full fifty thousand dollars in, say, the March, Baz, and April, May monthly activity statements, then you've got no credits available, as you've used your maximum entitle. However, come one July, you'll be entitled to a further fifty thousand. If you haven't exceeded your fifty thousand dollar cap pre thirty June, then you will still be entitled to those uh, cash boost credits up until thirty June up again to the maximum of $50,000. So, so, that oh, no, so that'll be dependent on whether you lodge quarterly or monthly. So if you're a monthly lodger, um, April would have been lodged. May is about to be lodged, I think from memory. So yeah, as long as you're, you're under the $50,000 cap, you'll still be entitled to credits this side of 30 June. Thanks, Claude. It, it does depend on what you, you know, what you have, what you've paid, what you've received, those sorts of things. However, there is, you know, if you're up to the fifty, I believe the payments then do come out in four monthly instalments. Claude, is that correct? Yeah, four oh, monthly uh, instalments of uh, twelve thousand five hundred dollars, starting in July. So you get one July, August, September, October. Correct? Yes, correct. 
So if that's if you're maxed out at that 50, that's what you should be expecting. Um, but it does depend on what you've you've already claimed. So um, and it does vary. So apologies for not being able to give the specifics, but um, um, perhaps we might be able to answer that if we if you want to check with us offline. Um, Claude, I'm going to hand this to you as well. What's the accounting treatment of stimulus funds and the treatment in tax returns? Yeah, so I'm, I'm guessing this refers to the cash flow boost stimulus package and also JobKeeper. Um, so if you're in a position where you're, so in regards to cash flow boost, if you're in a position where your account goes into credit and the ATO actually refunds you that credit amount, then that does get recorded in your accounts or accounting software as income. And we like to call it um, ATA cash flow boost payments, just so it's um, easily identifiable. However, um, it's not accessible income at year end. So whatever that amount is, um, will not be treated as taxable income when you do your 2020 accounts. With JobKeeper though, um, the rebates you receive for um, your JobKeeper monthly payments, they are accessible taxable income. So they will need to be treated. And again, we want to keep those identified separately as well. So the majority of our clients, we've um, either done it for them or, or, or asked them to do it, is set up two separate or two new income accounts, um, both called ATO, or sorry, one ATO cash flow boost payments and the other ATO JobKeeper payments. Uh, they're not subject to GST, so don't make them um, just uh, make them BAS excluded. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, like I said, so cash flow boost, not accessible for tax. JobKeeper needs to be included as income when you do your 2020 accounts. Thanks, Claude. Uh, the next question, when will, when will the JobKeeper end? And again, there's been a bit of talk about this um, and that started probably three to four weeks ago where there was a reference, I think it was a throwaway line that said, oh, JobKeeper, you know, would be cut short. Um, but that was very quickly followed up by the government saying, no, JobKeeper was here until September uh, because the intention was that it would be here for six months. Um, and then we've seen this week as well where if you're in the childcare industry, that was turned on its head again and they were told that JobKeeper would be getting turned off but it would be replaced by a different type of payment. So, look, there's a couple of questions in here that require me to shine up that crystal ball that I've got in the corner. Um, but unfortunately, given everything we've been through, it hasn't been working too well lately, so my apologies. Um, but we can say that the intention with JobKeeper is that it lasts six months. From, um, so um, from April to September. Um, and that is, you know, at the moment, from what we can tell, the government's overall intent, um, there has also been talk and speculation that JobKeeper may need to be extended because I think even though we haven't been hit as hard as some people expected, it seems to be in some cases that it's going to be a slow uptick. So there might be um, um, capacity for the government to say, okay, well, look, we're going to turn it off for some people. However, we can see certain industries hurting and we're seeing that as well. We're seeing some industries that this has really benefited and they are coming out of it, you know, hard and strong, other businesses are going to be very, very slow to recover, if at all. So it's going to be pretty tough. So unfortunately, I can't give you a firm answer on that, but we can tell you the intent is six months. September is the end date. Um, but we just need to keep watching what's happening. And, and again, we'll, we'll continue to talk to you and let you know what's happening whether it's via email, website, or webinars such as this. So happy to, and, and again, if you're unsure or you see something that you're not certain about, drop us a line. Um, the, the next question is similar. Um, in a federal budget, budget, they postponed until after the end of the financial year. Um, what will that mean? Look, again, we're, we're uncertain. The government, in my personal opinion, has done a very good job of um, supporting the economy and, and the country. Um, however, they need to um, you know, take steps to recover what they have been paying out. Now, whether they can do that this year, and I don't believe they can go too hard initially. Uh, in fact, they might have, might have to go the other way um, and just make it a bit softer for people. Um, but we really don't know. We're not getting anything out of Treasury or out of, 
out of Canberra at the moment as to what they're thinking. Um, we do know that interest rates are not going anywhere the way they're talking. We know that the governor of the Reserve Bank is saying the, the government needs to support um, business and the economy, um, meaning that we can't go too hard on things. However, you know, we're all realists, I think, at some point in the future, um, this debt that we're racking up needs to be repaid in relation to JobKeeper and cash boosts and all the rest. So whether it's in the form of um, increased personal taxes, increased corporate taxes, I hope not. I think that would be, um, you know, um, counterproductive to what we're trying to achieve. Um, what I think, pers again, personally, I think you know, an increase in GST is a possibility um, because it's consumption based and it's broad based. Um, so we might see that, you know, it might be the opportunity that both governments or all governments over the last 20 years have been looking for to increase the GST rate to perhaps, you know, help out with this. But at the same time, we've seen state governments looking to alleviate some of the pain in relation to stamp duty and payroll tax and things like that. So again, if we can get rid of some of those other nasties that we've still got that were meant to have disappeared 20 years ago would be fantastic but sadly i don't have a read on which way the budget's going we don't we're not getting anything through our professional bodies through our colleagues anything at the moment unfortunately i can't help you with that but happy to talk once we do know um what kind of stimulus package from both federal and state can we expect in the future um, again, we talked a little bit about this. The state government, again, have come out in the last week with their, um, you know, the construction industry type incentive packages, as have the federal government. So you'll probably see more of this. I think they do need to stimulate activity, um, stimulate the flow of funds through business. And so this has been moving at a rapid rate where we've seen, as I said, there's, there's two changes, three changes in the last week that we've seen. There was a federal government um, building subsidy, then the state government came out a couple of days later, then they extended the instant asset tax write-off. So the government are being fairly nimble, all governments not being political here, they're all working hard to make sure that we can get these things happening. There's a lot of pressure on our state government as well, I know, to open borders. Um, but having said that, I, I think they're, they're doing a pretty good job of protecting us as a state so we can move forward. And given we've got a very healthy mining industry there, um, I think we're, we're faring quite well. So, so again, I can't answer that stimulus package, but it will be around business activity, business investment. Um, employment side of things is really tough because they've thrown a lot of money at it, but hopefully they've still got some in reserve that they can utilise. I think they're waiting, and Claude and I both know that when, and if you're doing your own monthly JobKeeper, um, um, reporting, you will know that you need to report on forecasts and then actuals. So the government are monitoring all of these figures to see which way we're going in the short term. Normally they have to do it 12 months in arrears, but they're monitoring month by month at the moment and they're monitoring week by week in relation to wages. So they know who's still employed, they know what wages they're getting, they know who's had a reduction. The information we're getting through the government is mind blowing as to the information we get on all of our clients that the ATO are already aware of. So they're, they're monitoring it, you know, minute by minute, second by second. So, um, and they're ready to pounce to try and help if it starts going the wrong direction. Um, and we'll keep you up to date, happy to do that. Um, this question was a bit out of left field, but I'm, I'm happy that it's been raised. Do I need, do I need um, to do long service leave and annual leave accruals for a small business? Um, and look, I think it's, there's two parts to this. Correctly, yes, you must be accruing um, long service leave and annual leave for your employees. So that's a legal requirement under Fair Work and all of the other employment laws. Um, if the question relates to do you need to be recording it in your accounts, um, there's a, it's a bit of a grey area. So if you're a larger employer with most of our clients, yes, we will accrue it. Um, if you're a smaller employer, as long as you've got those records, and we often find with smaller employers, it's not as significant or material, but as soon as you start to get a, a reasonable number of employees, it can mount up because it can be a big obligation. Um, Claude, do you want to 
add anything to that? Yeah, no, not too much, Kelvin, apart from the fact, like you said, if, um, if you do employ a large number of people, employees, and you ha have been there with you for a while, um, you may be surprised on the level of um, entitlements that um, you're obliged to pay. So we always say if, if once you get to a certain level, and that level is dependent on, on personal circumstances and, and businesses, is to record in your accounts um, so it's visible, it's transparent, um, you can see what the figure is. Um, but in saying that, at the same time, most good payroll softwares um, do allow you to bring up reports that can give you those leave entitlements or leave accruals at any given point in time. So whether you want to do it, show them into your accounts, it is a personal preference. Um, like I said, there's arguments either, either way for it, but um, yeah, I think once you get to that certain level of, of accruals, then it's probably not a bad idea to have it included in your financials. Yes, it, it sort of, it's, yeah, prudent to do it if, uh, if you are building up obligations. Uh, importantly as well, it's not a tax consideration from our point of view, because you may accrue that amount, but it's not a tax deduction if it's brought into your accounts until it's paid. So, so it's not hard and fast tax law, you must do this or you mustn't do this. It's more of an accounting requirement um but we look at materiality so um and you know if you if whoever asked that question i can't recall who it was but if you want to drop us a line and say well i've got this many employees i've got this i've got that we can give you a bit of a bit of a bead on where you should be uh are there any changes in tax filing this year not necessarily claude touched earlier on you know job keeper and the cash flow um boosts but you know cash flow boosts non-taxable um uh, JobKeeper is taxable. Uh, everything else is pretty much run of the mill. The ATO have, uh, in certain circumstances, allowed deferrals to, of lodgements, but they relate to the 19 year. They're just sort of saying, all right, everyone's in a lot of pain. We'll give you a bit of breathing space, including us accountants who are lodging you know, thousands of tax returns each year. But apart from that, Claude, there's no significant changes in lodgement this year, is there? No, no, they haven't announced. The only thing they have announced, like you said, Kelvin, is that if you were due um, 15th of May to lodge your 2019 return, the ATO did defer that firstly to the first week of June and then they extended that to the middle of June, I think. So, but yeah, like you said, Kelvin, that's for the 2019 year. Mm. Um, don't know if, I don't, don't know if this is a, a tax filing or this answers, but one of the things that is um, that has come out, which was interesting, is the ATO has... Um, announced a work from home deduction on tax returns for the 2020 year. Um, and it's basically a flat rate of, I think it's 80 cents per hour that you work from home for the period, you know, whenever we went into lockdown or isolation, which might've been March. Um, and, but all they, all they have said on that is um, when you do, lodge your 2020 tax return you need to specify it as home office expense COVID-19 yeah. so whether that's a way for um, the ATO to track to make sure that you know you haven't put down a thousand hours working from home when there was only you know the most of us will probably work from home you know six to eight weeks in that period so yeah so that's the only thing that they've come out specifically and said um, but nothing else as far as changes as of, as of yet. It certainly feels like we worked a thousand hours at home, Claude. So I don't know you and I both uh, worked pretty hard during that period, and it's it's continuing. So I uh, might have to work out what a thousand hours at eighty cents per hour is, and uh, see how that stacks up in my tax return. Mm. You might you might need to help me with that one. Yeah. Um, uh, the next question: How can I minimise tax and claim tax benefits? Okay. Well, hopefully we've helped you to understand how you can minimise tax. Uh, and again, as we said, we do some fairly in-depth tax planning with clients at this time of year, but at least I'm hoping that we pointed you in the right direction. Um, claiming tax benefits, um, I'm not sure what specifically you mean by that, if there are any benefits, but hopefully, again, it's sort of one and the same that we've, we've looked to minimise your tax, to, to maximise your cash flow position and, and you know, optimise your, your overall life and, and business. So... Um, hopefully that uh, that explains it all. Uh, this is one I'm flicking to Claude. I know who asked this question. Thanks for that, Thorns. But um, 
Can you explain the smoothing process used for variable or seasonal type revenue to understand if the 30% revenue reduction test for JobKeeper is met? So Claude, that's, that's your baby. Yeah, so um, very quickly, this falls under the um, alternative tests for working out your declining turnover. Um, and it's mainly to do with businesses that have um, irregular turnover. So, and it's not um, a fair call to compare one month this year to one month last year. Um, so very briefly, so let's say that you're using the June 2020 quarter as your test period. Then what you need to do is you need to go back your four previous quarters. So in that case it would be March 20, December 19, September 19 and June 19 quarters. You work out what your turnover is for each of those quarters. You get your lowest quarter and your highest quarter. And if that, if your lowest is more than 50% of your highest, then you um, meet the that alternative test. Um, there's not much more to it than that, um, but they do say that you cannot apply it if your business is cyclical. This is only for businesses that have irregular lump sum payments every three months, six months, whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. So you just you just compare your previous four quarters, work out which one of those is your lowest, which one is your highest, and if the difference is the fifty percent mark, then um, you do qualify for that alternative test. But um, happy to chat more or provide you with a bit more guidance offline um, to um, whoever answered that question or asked that question, I should say. Thanks, Claude. It might be a bit easier if we know the sort of quantum of numbers and that sort of thing. Yep. So. And what type of business too, it just helps to add some flavour to it. Um, the next question, if, is a logbook created during the COVID-19 lockdown period valid, even if it only has a few hundred kilometres in total? Um, look, the tax office really look at logbooks and say it must be representative of the use of that vehicle. So if the use of that vehicle during the lockdown period represented what your long-term usage is, um, then that's valid. Okay, in my view, anyway, and Claude, you, you, again, you've dug into this more than I have, but um, it has to be representative. It, it's a 12-week period that you can keep a logbook for. And I think it used to be five years you had to keep a new logbook, Claude, or if your usage changed. Is that that's still the case? Correct, Calvin, yes. Yep. Yeah, so it, it just needs to be representative. Now, if you, um, you know, like a lot of people, and I know my car went nowhere for a long period of time if you had a car that just went nowhere at all so therefore you showed your private usage and similarly your business usage is you know zero um or very low then and then you started driving home to work and you were driving to the beach and go to go for surf and all the rest of it that period is not really representative okay so you need to sort of be a bit um reasonable in that on that basis because and it's pretty obvious because if during the lockdown period, you only did 100 kilometres um, for, for example, 10 weeks. But then outside of lockdown, you do 100 kilometres every couple of days, then it's not representative. There's been too big a change. So you just need to keep that in mind when with any logbook. I mean, it can even change if you, um, you are working in one location and then it changes dramatically to, you know, working from home um, and running a business out of home. That would constitute a change of overall use of the car, business or personal. Um, and it, it's pretty simple for the ATO to track that down too. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Are state-based government grants taxable income? Claude, your question. Yeah, look, so I'm sort of, I can only deal with WA-based grants here, not knowing, I know there's a few interstate uh, people on here. Um, but in regards to WA, I suppose the biggest grant is if you pay payroll tax and your and your wages bill is, I think, a million dollars minimum. Or sorry, if, it's, if your wages are between a certain threshold, and I don't want to say the numbers in case I get it wrong, but you'll get a grant automatically of $17,500 in July. Um, I've tried to get a, a definitive answer both by the Office of State Revenue and the ATO, um, with no luck at this stage, but I would assume that grants 
um, would be treated as taxable income. Um, there's nothing. In our, in our, yeah, sorry, I was going to say in our experience previously, yep. if something isn't taxable, they let you know about it very early on. They will say to you, this is a tax free grant. This is a, you know, a grant in relation to apprentices or, or, um, you know, some other form of, uh, of issue that they want to deal with. So it is normally highlighted, you know, long and loud. Um, but from what we can tell at the moment, all of these things are, are taxable that are coming through, apart from the boosting cash flow amounts. Yep. Okay. I'm um, sorry, I'm very conscious of time here. I want to keep people running along if we can. Receiving job keeper payments into accounting software. Claude, you dealt with that previously. Um, yeah, so like I said before, uh, cash flow boost um, and job keeper uh, create two new income accounts. Uh, one called cash flow boost, one called job keeper. So you can easily identify them, not only to yourself, but to your accountant. Um, cash flow boost, non accessible. Job keeper is accessible for tax purposes. Okay. Thank you, Claude. Hopefully that answers the, that question. Uh, are you guys going to continue these webinars? Look, the short answer is yes, we will, as long as people find them useful. We're, um, it does give us a chance to answer these sorts of questions, which are many and varied. So, um, and it also allows us to you know, relay this information to a wider audience, um, rather than sort of spending hour upon hour upon hour on one-on-one -on -one phone calls. So, we're very happy to run these if there is a demand for it. And, um, and so I appreciate any feedback. As you know, we're, we're keen to hear how people are finding these and be perfectly honest and brutally honest. Let us know if uh, we're boring you to tears. Um, but at the same time, let us know if you find them useful. Let us know what you'd want to, what you like about them, what you want to hear about, where, how we can help you. Um, I'm trying to sort of engage other people um, you know, as some of you know, we had a couple of our other team members on a few weeks ago and it was fantastic. So I don't want to be the one, you know, front and center in this. I'd prefer to be in the background. Um, but let us know, happy to do these. So short answer, yes, we will continue to do these, even if it's monthly, um, because there's so much goes on in our world. And I know in your world as well, where, you know, we're, we're happy to educate, uh, inform and, um, and just assist wherever possible. Um, I quite enjoy them because it does allow us to engage with a pretty broad group. Uh, and, you know, there's clients on here that I've known for many years but don't get to deal with regularly, so it's great. Um, so that's my response to that. Oh, and that was the end of the questions. Now, I do know there was a question raised by Alex, I believe. Um, where is your question, Alex? Can assets that are still being depreciated from former years able to now be written off. This is a good one because we've, um, we've tackled this over the last few weeks. Claude, I'm going to hand to you because this has got to do with pooling. Yeah, so the short answer, Alex, is yes or no, depending on how you've got your assets. If you keep your assets in a pool, a general pool, um, and the balance of that pool is, well, normally- Now, Claude, we, now Claude just to explain, I, that makes sense to me, but you oh, don't sorry. make a swimming pool, do you, mate? No, sorry. So when I say a pool, it's a, you pull all your assets. So the good old days, each asset was identified separately and had a, its own rate of um, depreciation um, based on what the ATO guidelines. They then a few years back came out and said, rather than tracking all your assets individually and giving each one a different rate, whether it be 5%, 10%, 20%, so forth, you can put them all into what was called a, a a, low, um, a general asset pool and every time an asset got added to that pool you got an automatic 15 percent deduction for the first year and then every year after that the pool balance gives you a 30 percent deduction um so yes yeah, so i didn't mean the swing pool when i said a pool um but the benefit of that is um previously when the instant asset write-off was thirty thousand dollars if your asset, if your, the total asset pool pre 30 June 20 was below 30,000, you can write off that remainder as a, as a deduction. With the instant asset write off increasing to 150,000, if your pool balance is below 150, you get that, you can write that complete amount off, which is a fairly significant deduction 
um, on your assets, on your existing assets. Um, so happy, happy to chat further uh, to Alex on that or send us an email. But yeah, so that, that is a good, a good outcome if you do keep your um, assets in a um, general pool. If the balance at the end of the year is below 150, then you're entitled to a write that off completely for the 2020 year. Thanks, Claude. Um, but that's been an interesting one. We jumped on that pretty early and, uh, and did our homework. So uh, made sure that that was uh, uh, good. Yes, have a chat to Jethro about that for sure. So he's across that. Um, so, um, you know, you can tell him that you know all about it now, Alex, and, uh, you know, tell him, uh, tell him what you're aware of. Oh, sorry, I, I flicked too far ahead. Look, thank you, guys. That's all of the questions, I believe, unless something else has just popped up. Um, I think that's it. If I've missed anything, please let me know, guys. Um, but apart from that, look, really appreciate your time. We have gone a bit over time as well, so I apologise. We've listed on there um, some resources that are on our website. I invite you to go and take a look. The one that the 17 ways to minimise uh, that's up there, minimise business tax, great article. Um, Claude pulled together, fantastic. So um, have a read through that as well. There's all of the all of the um, FAQs on the JobKeeper and those sorts of things, JobKeeper monthly reporting and FBT. So I invite you to jump around our website. There's a lot of content on there. Um, I'm doing my best to post on social media. If you do follow us on Twitter or um, LinkedIn, um, as well as our, our you know, firm website, as is Claude. So, um, so apart from that, look, thank you so much for, for jumping on board and, and seeing a few faces out there. Not everyone was going to turn their camera on, but a few were, so it's good to see you. Um, and I um, look forward to seeing you all again fairly soon. So enjoy your weekend, have a good Friday, and, um, and thanks for joining us. Um, we will speak to you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.